impact landing has kicked it up. It has kind of like a, a shear on it, so mm -hmm. it's like clumpy, which suggests that there's a high clay element. The wreck landing has kicked it up. It has kind of like a, a shear on it, so mm -hmm. it's like clumpy, which suggests that there's a high clay element. So it's probably pretty silty and clay. Um, so it's probably pretty silty and clay. Um, clay -y, which is probably one of the reasons why the, the wreck the wrecks slam so hard or bury themselves so much into it. Mm -hmm. I think we should drag Atlanta more due north. So we have a few meters left in this last moat. Uh, we probably have most of it left, 15 meters. Yeah, I, I think if you do that, that'll swing us right around what we can see of the extents of it. We're seeing nothing yeah. more to the... Uh, yeah, it's easier to, to transit across the stern of a ship if you know where the stern is. Right. And if you don't, then what's the possibility of obstruction? A little bit. Hmm. Yeah, well, that on really the seems like a solid definition there. And At the it end? matches up with the sonar quite well. Yep. We do have some pieces on the far side. So I know the U.S. battleships were massively thick. The USS Iowa I sailed on had 13-inch hull plating. How thick were these ships? That's a good question. That's uh, our resident expert, John Parshall, has stepped away, unfortunately, but he probably would know that offhand. Um, so these were built in the 20s, and I'm not... Well, I guess the, ba the U.S. battleships, um, late, like late Arizona, 30s. were also... Or excuse me, the Iowa or Jersey class, those yeah. last four were all in the late yeah. 30s, yeah. Well, well, you're probably referring to the armor belt of thickness. This had an armor belt, according to the online record anyway, of six inches, 152 okay. millimeters. But of course, that's not the entire hull, that's the armor belt. Can you explain that term, armor belt? Where would that be around a ship? That, that would circle? be the thickest part. Um, a circle? Near the water line. What do you think that is? Extending down into the water line? Oh, so uh, ra wrapped around. A wrapped torpedo ar protection also? Or? Wrapped around the ship, yeah, extending down. Hey, Nala, quick thought here. Um, yesterday's dive on Akagi, we, we observed the curvature of the small boat uh, hangar on both port and starboard ends. I mean, are you seeing any curvature here with where that fair lead is mounted? I mean, I wonder if it could be uh, could be similarly curved inboard. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Thanks, Phil. And uh, I don't know if you know the hangers had that same curvature or if some were more squared off. Um, yeah, but we haven't seen it yet here once we work our way down to look back and shoot straight down that rail and see if this curves inboard and if that aligns with what we saw on the other vessel. So watch leave net. Uh, we're trying to, I think at this point we want to kind of bring Atalanta back um, sort of in the image it would be up to the northeast of what you're seeing right now. Northwest, sorry. Um, so back towards the wreck and then trying to move forward. Well, we want to loop around the stern, right? Well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, but I don't think we want to progress much further to the east or else we're just going to lose the uh, visual. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I, I think I think maybe making a, um, a move in like at 45 degrees to kind of take us across the back of the wreck uh, and we can kind of sp uh, spin to the left as we do and keep it in sight. Does that make sense? So, yeah, my thoughts were a 20 meter move, uh, basically due north. Um, and that's, that I that might take us too close to the the, the 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 far side and into the structure, I would think. Because if we're facing 45 now, north would put us kind of back into the wreck. So I'd, I'd say maybe 20 meters at 45. Let me see so. what we have left on the, the last move. 
um, distance. <coughs> so I am pointing at zero four five right now. Mm -hmm. And we do have this, that, no. round, that round shape yeah. over there. Now that may be sort of a similar aft deck potential captain where the wire hanger, or that wire rope was uh, coiled so on the truck. I think we got 10 meters left moving down uh, bearing 110. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see, Derek. I understand now. So, yeah, I I agree with you then to move directly north at first because we are still moving away. Yeah. Okay, I understand. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Bridge nap. Plan approved. <laughs> uh, can we do a ship move, please? Two zero meters, bearing zero zero zero. Thank you. Phil, oh. Phil, did you say you saw some aft deck equipment? Well, I, I, perhaps not mentioning, don't need to mention now, but uh, we'll get a better view of of what was also on Akagi's aft deck, that circular um, structure that had wire rope coiled right. in. Right, yeah. It's just in the shadows here. I see um, what you mean. That's going to be great. To get to that. We're headed that way now, right, Nev? Towards that circle? Oh, that's the idea, yeah. Okay. Uh, you can see that curvature that uh, ECC was talking about from this angle. You know, and I, I wonder, given that the outermost propeller, the propellers that were outermost may have cavitation issues. I wonder if it was a design strategy um, to, to, to clear, you know, to clear thrust and to maximize maximize propeller efficiency. Doesn't look like that curves inboard and then resolves to straight, right where it breaks off, like it's curvilinear. Yeah, so. a little bit, but I mean, if there's structure, if there's a lot of hull missing back here, yeah, it could tell. be deformation. I'm guessing we're not going to see the characters. Uh, yeah, I don't on, think. On the, I don't think those exist anymore. Yeah. Well, so you think that the stern kind of just fell off somewhere else, and well, it's a, it's a significant, it's significantly buried, and it is all low and and flat back here because the upper flight deck is absolutely gone, so it does drop way down. But on the sonar image we're looking at from the 2019 survey by Vulcan Inc., you know, there's there's the outline of the stern. That's true. However... So it's not completely gone. It's if, just... it's, if it's buried at all, uh, side scan sonar does scan to the side, but it also does scan a little bit down, so you can sense stuff that's slightly buried. Oh, that's true. Um, so it may be, j if it's just below the mud line, the mud, we, you can still get a return on it. And that may be what happened there. Yeah, that's true. It's something we found out at Swain's Atoll using a high-frequency sonar in the lagoon. Hmm. There was about 12 feet of biogenic ooze that was soft like cocoa puffs, and that <laughs> high-frequency that high-frequency sonar was penetrating. We couldn't get down to the targets that we were picking yeah. up on the sonar. Yeah, we had the same problem in the Black Sea. We would sense. We would detect targets with the, the side scan, and then they wouldn't be there. And uh, initially, we thought it was our navigation, but other targets we were we would find okay. So we figured it was if they were slightly buried, and the Black Sea has a lot of that similar oozy, loose m sediment on the top. Yeah, we mud, that mud and clay tend to have similar uh, acoustic properties as water, so that uh, sound tends to transmit right through it. It doesn't really act as a second layer, so. Yeah, right. Yeah. These these were kind of greenish cyanobacteria puffballs that Okay, that's gross. Just... That sounds gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll stop there. Yeah. Cocoa puff sounded better. <laughs> yeah, certainly the, the, the scanning sonar we have now is not picking up what the overhead yeah. scans well, granted four years ago. 
saw looking well, I, down. Well, I don't think that there's any process that would remove the stern of a wreck at this depth. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. It would be a matter of, yeah. uh, I guess, sedimentation. But, like, the, um, the scanning sonar is entirely horizontal, whereas the side scan is partially vertical, so you can, you can sense into the seabed a bit. Gotcha. We have a nice sunrise in front of us at the bow. It's kind of interesting. I was looking at the backscatter from this morning when we mapped it with our multi-beam. Yeah. That's what we have in the background there on high back. And uh, it looks like the brightest reflection we got off with our sonar was from that kind of area where that large um, piece of metal was sort of leaning off the ship near behind the casement guns. Oh, yeah. After the casement guns. As far as we can tell, that's seems to be what it was kind of reflecting off of. And the area where we initially landed didn't look very bright at all. Right. We just caught that piece at a good angle. Yeah. Sometimes it's all about the angle of what you're trying to, what you bounce off, just depending on the orientation of the ship. Speaking of Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to uh, take a break here and come up and then relieve you. Yeah, sounds good. Unfortunately, we don't have cocoa puffs on the ship, as far as I know. I, I saw Fruit Loops this morning. Well, I thought that we had something like cocoa puffs, but it turns out that it's raisins, and that's not going to um, happen. Nope. Nope. In one of those uh, cereal jars, it's actually oh, just so raisins. That's so you can make your own raisin bran. <laughs> yeah, nope. I hope you realized that before you filled up a bowl full of raisins. And yeah, that didn't happen either. Thankfully, the chocolate chip cookies they make are actually that and not raisins, I and mm -hmm. that would have made me very sad. Yeah, I did not know those were raisins. I don't know why I thought they were chocolate chips, so that's good I to know. I thought so, too, yeah, and I, I looked really carefully, and I was like, I nope. I, th I don't think any of us have eaten any of the raisins. Seems like our previous ship move is just about resolved down, huh? It's a long pendulum. Yeah, it is. So just to update everyone on shore who's watching, um, we are at the very end of the wreck to the, at the stern. Uh, we're now facing back towards the wreck, waiting for um, some ship moves to bring us back. Uh, and we're gonna then start um, maneuvering forward from the stern towards the bow and looking at the uh, the starboard side of the ship. Just give us a couple of minutes to line ourselves back up and get the ship in the right place so we can um, return to the wreck. And I'm going to throw the sonar back up to 150 just to yeah. get a look at... Uh... So as we sit here, I'm just looking at the beautiful sunrise and I'm just reminded of how special um, this area is and how sacred these waters are here in Papua Hanau, Mokuakea Marine National Monument and just how grateful I am to be out here experiencing this. And um, I was just gonna ask Malia, would you be able to share a little bit about the cultural protocol that happened this morning before Atalanta started this dive? Sure thing. So. Um we do cultural protocol before every single ROV dive. We did cultural protocol when we left port. Um, and it's just a real in integral part of the work that we're doing um, in Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, why do we do it? Because it really helps us to center ourselves and to ask permission 
um, when you come from an indigenous um, perspective, from Kanako O'ivi perspective, Native Hawaiian perspective, um, we are interconnected with our entire environment. So as human beings, we're not dominating over any of the ecosystems or natural resources, but we are a component of those natural systems. And so when you view the world in that way, Play which is probably one of the reasons why the, the wreck the wrecks slam so hard or bury themselves mm -hmm. so much into it. Mm -hmm. I think we should drag Adelina more due north. So we have a few meters left in this last move? Uh, we probably have most of it left, 15 meters. Yeah, I, I think if you do that, that'll swing us right around what we can see of the extents of it. We're seeing nothing yeah. more to the... Uh, yeah, it's easier to, to transit across the stern of a ship if you know where the stern is. Right. And if you don't, then what's the possibility of obstruction? A little bit. Hmm. Yeah, well, that on really the seems like a solid definition there. At the end? It matches up with the sonar quite well. Yep. We do have some pieces on the far side. So I know the U.S. battleships were massively thick. The USS Iowa I sailed on had 13-inch hull plating. How thick were these ships? That's a good question. That's uh, our resident expert, John Parshall, has stepped away, unfortunately, but he probably would know that offhand. Um, so these were built in the 20s, and I'm not... Well, I guess the, ba the U.S. battleships, um, like Lake Arizona, Paris. were also... Or excuse me, the Iowa or Jersey class, those yeah. last four were all in the late yeah. 30s. Yeah. Well, well, you're probably referring to the armor belt of thickness. This had an armor belt, according to the online record anyway, of six inches, 152 okay. millimeters. But of course, that's not the entire hull. That's the armor belt. Can you explain that term, armor belt? Where would that be around a ship? That, that would circle? be the thickest part. Um, a circle? Near the water line. What do you think that is? Extending down into the water line? So uh, ra wrapped a around. A wrapped torpedo ar protection also? Or? Wrapped around the ship, yeah, extending down. Hey, Nala, quick thought here. Um, yesterday's dive on Akagi, we, we observed the curvature of the small boat uh, hangar on both port and starboard ends. I mean, are you seeing any curvature here with where that fair lead is mounted? I mean, I wonder if it could be uh, could be similarly curved inboard. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Thanks, Phil. And uh, I don't know if you know the hangers had that same curvature or if some were more squared off. Um, yeah, but we haven't seen try. it yet here once we work our way down to look back and shoot straight down that rail and see if this curves inboard and if that aligns with what we saw on the other vessel. So watch lead net. Uh, we're trying to, I think at this point, we want to kind of bring Atalanta back um, sort of in the image. It would be up to the northeast of what you're seeing right now. Northwest, sorry. Um, so back towards the wreck and then trying to move forward. Well, we want to loop around the stern, right? Well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, but I don't think we want to progress much further to the east or else we're just going to lose the uh, visual. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I, I think I think maybe making a, um, a move in, like at 45 degrees to kind of take us across the back of the wreck uh, and we can kind of sp uh, spin to the left as we do and keep it in sight. Does that make sense? So, yeah, my thoughts were a 20 meter move, uh, basically due north. Um, and that's, that I that might take us too close to the the, the 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 far side and into the structure, I would think. Because if we're facing 45 now, north would put us kind of back into the wreck. So I'd, I'd say maybe 20 meters at 45. Let me see so. what we have left on the, the last move. 
distance. <coughs> so I am pointing at 045 right now. Mm -hmm. And we do have this, that, no. round, that round shape. Yeah. Now that may be sort of a similar aft deck potential captain where the wire hanger or that wire rope was uh, coiled so, on the body. I think we got 10 meters left moving down uh, bearing 110. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Derek, I understand now. So, yeah, I, I agree with you then to move directly north at first because we are still moving away. Yeah. Okay. I understand. That makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Bridge nap. Plan approved. <laughs> Uh, can we do a ship move, please? Two zero meters bearing zero zero zero. Thank you. Phil, oh. Phil, did you say you saw some aft deck equipment? Well, I, I perhaps not mentioning. Don't need to mention now, but uh, we'll get a better view of of what was also on Akagi's aft deck. That circular. Um, structure that had wire rope coiled right. in. Right, yeah. It's just in the shadows here. I see um, what you mean. That's going to be great. To look at. Okay. We're headed that way now, right, Nev? Towards that circle? Uh, that's the idea, yeah. Okay. Now you can see that curvature that uh, ECC was talking about from this angle. You know, and I, I wonder, given that the outermost propeller, the propellers that were outermost may have cavitation issues. I wonder if it was a design strategy um, to, to, to clear you know, to clear thrust and to maximize, maximize propeller efficiency. Doesn't it look like that curves inboard and then resolves to straight right where it breaks off? Like it's curvilinear. Yeah, a little bit, but I mean, if there's structure, if there's a lot of hull missing back here, yeah, it could tell. be deformation. I'm guessing we're not going to see the characters. Uh, yeah, I don't on, think. On the, I don't think those exist anymore. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> So you think that the stern kind of just fell off somewhere else, and well, it's it's, it's a significant it's significantly buried, and it is all low and, and flat back here because the upper flight deck is absolutely gone, so it does drop way down. But on the sonar image we're looking at from the 2019 survey by Vulcan Inc., you know, there's there's the outline of the stern. That's true. However, so it's not completely gone. It's if it's if it's buried at all, uh, side scan sonar it does scan to the side, but it also does scan a little bit down. So you can sense stuff that's slightly buried. Oh, that's true. Um, so it may be if it's just below the mud line, the mud, we you can still get a return on it, and that may be what happened there. Yeah, that's true. It's something we found out at Swain's Atoll using a high-frequency sonar in the lagoon. Hmm. There was about 12 feet of biogenic ooze that was soft like cocoa puffs. And that <laughs> high-frequency high sonar was penetrating. We couldn't get down to the targets that we were picking yeah. up on the sonar. Yeah, we had the same problem in the Black Sea. We would sense, we would detect targets with the the side scan and then they wouldn't be there and uh, initially we thought it was our navigation but other targets we were we would find okay so we figured it was if they were slightly buried and the black sea has a lot of that similar oozy loose sediment on the top yeah we mud, that mud and clay tend to have similar uh acoustic properties as water so that uh sound tends to transmit right through it it doesn't really act as a second layer so yeah right yeah. These, these were kind of greenish cyanobacteria puffballs that... Okay, that's gross. Just... That sounds gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Cocoa puffs sounded better. <laughs> yeah, certainly the, the, the scanning sonar we have now is not picking up what the overhead yeah. scans, well, granted four years ago, saw. 
Well, I, I don't think that there's any process that would remove the stern of a wreck at this depth. Oh, no. Four years. Oh, no, no. It would be a matter of, yeah. uh, I guess, sedimentation. But, like, the, um, the scanning sonar is entirely horizontal, whereas the side scan is partially vertical, so you can, you can sense into the seabed a bit. Gotcha. We have a nice sunrise in front of us at the bow. It's kind of interesting. I was looking at the backscatter from this morning when we mapped it with our multi-beam. Yeah. That's what we have in the background there on high back. And uh, it looks like the brightest reflection we got off with our sonar was from that kind of area where that large um, piece of metal was sort of leaning off the ship near behind the casement guns. Oh, yeah. After the casement guns. As far as we can tell, that seems to be what it was kind of reflecting off of. And the area where we initially landed didn't look very bright at all. Right. We just caught that piece at a good angle. Yeah. Sometimes it's all about the angle of what you're trying to, what you bounce off, just depending on the orientation of the ship. Speaking of Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to uh, take a break here and come up and then relieve you. Yeah, sounds good. Unfortunately, we don't have cocoa puffs on the ship, as far as I know. I, I saw Fruit Loops this morning. Well, I thought that we had something like cocoa puffs, but it turns out that it's raisins, and that's not going to happen. Um, nope. Nope. In one of those uh, cereal jars, it's actually oh, just so raisins. That's so you can make your own raisin bread. Yeah, nope. It's true. I hope you realized that before you filled up a bowl full of raisins. And <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen either. Thankfully, the chocolate chip cookies they make are actually that and not raisins, I and mm -hmm. that would have made me very sad. Yeah, I did not know those were raisins. I don't know why I thought they were chocolate chips, so that's good I to thought know. so, too, yeah, and I, I looked really carefully, and I was like, I nope. I, th I don't think any of us have eaten any of the raisins. Seems like our previous ship move is just about resolved down, huh? It's a long pendulum. Yeah, it is. So just to update everyone on shore who's watching, um, we are at the very end of the wreck to the, at the stern. Uh, we're now facing back towards the wreck, waiting for um, some ship moves to bring us back. Uh, and we're going to then start um, maneuvering forward from the stern towards the bow and looking at the, uh, the starboard side of the ship. Just give us a couple of minutes to line ourselves back up and get the ship in the right place so we can um, return to the wreck. And I'm going to throw the sonar back up to 150 just to yeah. get a look at... Uh, So as we sit here, I'm just looking at the beautiful sunrise and I'm just reminded of how special um, this area is and how sacred these waters are here in Papua Hanau, Mokuakea Marine National Monument and just how grateful I am to be out here experiencing this. And um, I was just gonna ask Malia, would you be able to share a little bit about the cultural protocol that happened this morning before Atalanta started this dive? Sure thing. So. Um we do cultural protocol before every single ROV dive. We did cultural protocol when we left port. Um, and it's just a real in integral part of the work that we're doing um, in Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, why do we do it? Because it really helps us to center ourselves and to ask permission 
um, when you come from an indigenous um, perspective, from Kanako O'ivi perspective, Native Hawaiian perspective, um, we are interconnected with our entire environment. So as human beings, we're not dominating over any of the ecosystems or natural resources, but we are a component of those natural systems. And so when you view the world in that way, you consider it your kin, your ohana, your family. You consider it your kin, your ohana, your family. And so as we come out into Papahana Mokoakea, we acknowledge that relationship, that time and depth and breadth of the relationship that we have with this Aina Akua, um, you know, the realm of the gods and the ancestors. And so that cultural protocol helps us to acknowledge those relationships, to acknowledge those um, spiritual and genealogical connections that we have with lands and with ocean and with Kanaloa who is manifested in the ocean, our um, god of the sea. And so cultural protocol is just really um, important part. And how we conduct that is through oli or chants. Um, we ask for permission to enter these um, sacred spaces. We ask for the ancestors and the deities to be with us and to guide us and to reveal um, you know, the things that are hidden. And as you all have been with us on this expedition, we have been revealed so much. I think this has been one of the most incredibly rich and um, incredibly rich biologically, but also archeologically. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just are very grateful and always with a sense of reverence Mm -hmm. for the world around us and you know especially for these archaeological dives you know we over 3,000 human beings lost their life in this tragic um, war and so you know part of the sacredness of Papa Hanau Mokuakea um, is now another element added to it with the the war dead from the Battle of Midway in 1942 so you know, cultural protocol, important part of what we do here. We'll be doing uh, this evening, we'll be doing a hula, the three, four of us, Kanaka O'ivi, Native Hawaiian women on board um, the OET Nautilus, will be um, performing a hula to honor um, the sailors and the airmen from mm -hmm. America and from Japan and to honor this space that we're in. And so, you know, that's our way of offering a ho'okupu. It's a tribute um, to the lives and the, the sacrifice they made for their countries. Mm. Amazing. And we have, uh, you know, our sh shipmates who are Native Hawaiian who are here working alongside us. They're not just here for the cultural aspects that they mm -hmm. bring but they're part of the ROV team, they're part of the video team, they're part of the science team. Uh, and it's, it's really nice to have uh, that rep represented in uh, the Nautilus crew that we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of, you know, the, the ship to shore that we do, um, especially in Olelo Hawaii, in the Hawaiian language, that our young people in Hawaii see role models. Mm -hmm. Um, see that there are opportunities for them to be doing all the different types of jobs that are available here. Um, our ancestors were scientists. You know, we, our knowledge system is based on observation and um, deep intimacy and knowledge of our ecosystems. And so we carry that forward. Scientists of the past, scientists of the present, um, scientists of the future, um, and cultural practitioners, um, just a very holistic understanding and way of being with our environment. Mm -hmm. So I think right now we're looking at basically the blowout from the landing. Almost looks in line with the shipwreck. Wow, well, you think Seven that's like an impact crater there? Or the, or the wave, pressure wave? 
popping it out, but we seem to have some debris in the bottom there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, all of this sediment has been moved by the impact. Um, and there's probably debris spread within it uh, that we just can't see as well. I'm gonna bring the sonar back to uh, 10 meter grade, so 50 total. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I don't think we're, we would get anywhere close to it, but do keep in mind that behind us, as we're going along the starboard side, there is a large piece of wreckage off to the side. We'll, we'll um, take a look at that. I think once we get to the bow, we might go over there and take a look at that. Mm. Uh, behind us, like off to us, our starboard right now? No, the starboard side of the ship. Which is both, okay. which is the same thing right now. Let's see if I can pull anything out of this crater. Doubt it the light I have to work with. But might be able to save some of this later. I was really surprised with uh, processing some of the stuff from Yorktown. Uh, like looking inside those elevators, I could actually see the decking and everything laying on it. That is a gouge. Hawthorian oh, for scale. Can someone remind me the name? Is it Flying Headless or Headless Flying Chicken Monster? Got it. Uh, I think Sebastian might have stepped out. It's a Holothurian, I believe. Yeah, but they, it's a Headless Flying Chicken. Headless Chicken? Yeah. Headless Flying, flying chicken, chicken Monster. monster yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That is the common name that's referred to. Hey, this is Tito on the front row. I'm going to throw a shout out to my niece, Kelsey. I hope you can hear this. Love you. Oh, um, let me see if I can. Kelsey in St. No, Kelsey no. would be in Falmouth working today at, ah. uh, let's see, at Associates of Cape Cod, which they work nice. on horseshoe crab blood. Oh. oh, very cool. It's blue, right? Uh, it's so similar to, well, they use it for testing and yeah. many different yeah. things. Yeah, tons of stuff. I think that's how they test if a lab is star. I'm s we could have, yeah. We Super go maybe another science. 10 meters, same due north. Mm, well, Which is slow so to I respond. think we're centered, we're centered right up on it, so another 10 north. Let's say we want more of a 0, 7, 0. No? Am I looking at that wrong? So we're here. We want to come a little... Yeah, I'm at 335. We just want to go a little bit that way on the image. Um, okay, I thought we wanted to close range on that stern portion because they're still 20 meters away. Okay, let's go zero. Should we just do your heading right now? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, like and 20 meters is, in that direction. Um, 335. Okay. 335. And do we want to do 15? meters? Uh, why don't we go with 10 and that'll keep us, uh, that'll give us good viz on it and then we can start going a little bit off to the uh, east of it. Roger that. Mm. Bridge, nav. Please do a ship move 
10 meters, bearing 335. Thank you. Tito, she's in here. She says she loves you too, and that horseshoe crab blood is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. I don't want to digress, but I think it's used to verify that things have been cleaned in sterile surroundings or something. Lots of use. And if you've never seen a horseshoe crab, if you don't live on, I think it's just the Northeast, uh, look one up. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's amazing you look at the on, bottom. The, uh, on the full moons, the beaches oh, yeah. practically get covered. And I used to go to Swansea and work with my sister, and we'd go catch them. That's where my parents them. live. Yeah, yep. we used to sell them to the, uh, down the fishing boats to yeah. use as bait. Yeah, on a good full moon, you can barely walk out in the water without stepping on one. Yeah, they were yeah. just crazy. They're terrifying as a child <laughs> <laughs> in water. That's so interesting to hear. I've seen them only in like in aquariums before. Yeah. Supposedly they haven't changed in uh, quite a while. Yeah, they're like they're hundreds uh, of millions of years. Very old species. Randy has some cool horseshoe crab tattoos. Yes, he mm -hmm. does. And a beat. In Connecticut, there's a crowdsourced program for tracking them. So there's tagged horseshoe crabs and. If you find one on the beach, you take a picture of it, send it to the Department of Environmental Management, and they'll send you a silver coin with a horseshoe crab on it. What? And so they, they can track the movement of horseshoe crabs that way. That's a pretty wow. good incentive. Yeah. I want to do that. Um, uh, Where'd you say that was, Jim? Conne Connecticut. Connecticut. In yes. the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and Canada, it was uh, just normal recreational scuba divers who first observed and started reporting uh, what was became known as uh, sea star wasting syndrome uh, that devastated the stock of sea stars, especially the Pycnopodias, that were very, very large uh, sea stars, usually with 24 legs. Uh, mm. that has uh, been studied extensively, but a big role of c citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our colleagues, we were just up doing work with Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, they have a cadre of citizen scientists who will look at, you know, some of the camera footage they've recorded, and they have this portal where those people can log events. Uh, growing role for others to participate and contribute to this work. Yeah, there's all sorts of apps uh, mm -hmm. coming out for supporting citizen science. And so oh, you can contribute in many ways, even if you're not um, a scientist, per se. Well, if you uh, see something and wonder about it and form a question in your mind, uh, you're, you're a scientist. That's yeah. That's the process, the first steps in the process. Really just kind of stalled, it's weird. It's, uh, the view hasn't changed yeah. a, by a more than yeah. a meter or so. It's been know. three moves. So we put in a total of 40 meters, essentially trying to get back towards the stern and yet to really see it translate down the cable. Wow, do or you think not. we have a current? Not sure why that is. No, the Holothorian didn't seem to be affected. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, it, the little bits of marine snow we do see seem to be going straight down. Yeah, I feel like just once you have a certain amount of momentum in one direction, and oh then yeah, it's so hard to change. Yeah, we've yeah. been moving the other. Yeah, well, we'll give it time. I mean, we we obviously have to change direction, so it's it, a lot of cable. It, take, it takes the time it takes, yeah. right? Yeah, and I guess it does have probably a, that pendulum effect, whereas if you direct the force the opposite way, it's just going to swing it out even further at first. Mm -hmm. So 
so I'm hoping we can get near the stern before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Hand it off. Someone else's problem. <laughs> But it is one of the uh, characteristics of a four-hour watch is if you get uh, into a very difficult situation as you think of solutions. Somebody in and so as we come out into Papahanaumokuakea, we acknowledge that relationship, that time and depth and breadth of the relationship that we have with this Aina Akua. Um, you know, the realm of the gods and the ancestors. And so that cultural protocol helps us to acknowledge those relationships, to acknowledge those um, spiritual and genealogical connections that we have with lands and with ocean and with Kanaloa, who is manifested in the ocean, our um, god of the sea. And so cultural protocol is just really um, important part. And how we conduct that is through oli or chants. Um, we ask for permission to enter these um, sacred spaces. We ask for the ancestors and the deities to be with us and to guide us and to reveal, um, you know, the things that are hidden. And as you all have been with us on this expedition, we have been revealed so much. I think this has been one of the most incredibly rich and um, incredibly rich biologically, but also archaeologically. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just are very grateful and always with a sense of reverence mm -hmm. for the world around us. And, you know, especially for these archaeological dives, you know, we. Over 3,000 human beings lost their life in this tragic um, war. And so, you know, part of the sacredness of Papahanaumokuakea um, is now another element added to it with the, the war dead from the Battle of Midway in 1942. So, you know, cultural protocol, important part of what we do here, we'll be doing uh, this evening, we'll be doing a hula, the three, four of us, Kanaka O'ivi, Native Hawaiian women on board um, the OET Nautilus, will be um, performing a hula to honor um, the sailors and the airmen from mm. America and from Japan, and to honor this space that we're in. And so, you know, that's our way of offering a ho'okupu. It's a tribute. Um, to the lives and the, the sacrifice they made for their countries. Mm. Amazing. And we have, uh, you know, our sh shipmates who are native Hawaiian who are here working alongside us. They're not just here for the cultural aspects that they mm -hmm. bring, but they're part of the ROV team. They're part of the video team. They're part of the science team. Uh, and it's it's really nice to have uh, that rep represented in uh, the Nautilus crew that we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of, you know, the, the ship to shore that we do, um, especially in Olelo Hawaii, in the Hawaiian language, that our young people in Hawaii see role models, mm -hmm. um, see that there are opportunities for them to be doing all the different types of jobs that are available here. Um, our ancestors were scientists. You know, we our knowledge system is based on observation and um, deep intimacy and knowledge of our ecosystems. And so we carry that forward. Scientists of the past, scientists of the present, um, scientists of the future, um, and cultural practitioners, um, just a very holistic understanding and way of being with our environment. Mm -hmm. So I think right now we're looking at basically the blowout from the landing. Almost looks in line with the shipwreck. Wow, you think Senate, that's like an impact the, crater there? Or the or the wave, pressure wave popping it up, but we seem to have some debris in the bottom there. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, all of this sediment has been moved by the impact. Um, and there's probably debris spread within it uh, that we just can't see as well. I'm going to bring the sonar back to uh, 10 meter grade, so 50 total. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I don't think we would get anywhere close to it, but do keep in mind that behind us, as we're going along the starboard side, there is a large piece of wreckage off to the side. We'll, we'll um, take a look at that. I think once we get to the bow, we might go over there and take a look at that. Behind us, like off to us, our starboard right now? No, the starboard side of the ship. Which is both, okay. which is the same thing right now. Let's see if I can pull anything out of this crater. Doubt it the light I have to work with. But might be able to save some of this later. I was really surprised with uh, processing some of the stuff from Yorktown. Uh, like looking inside those elevators, I could actually see the decking and everything laying on it. That is a gouge. Hawthorian for scale. Can someone remind me the name? Is it Flying Headless or Headless Flying Chicken Monster? Got it. Uh, I think Sebastian it's a, might have stepped out. It's a Holothurian, I believe. Yeah, but the, it's a Headless Flying Chicken. Headless Chicken? Yeah. Headless Flying chicken, chicken Monster. monster yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That is the common name that's referred to. Hey, this is Tito on the front row. I'm going to throw a shout out to my niece, Kelsey. I hope you can hear this. Love you. Oh, uh, well, let me see if I is Kelsey in Saint. No, Kelsey no. would be in Falmouth working today at, ah. uh, let's see, at Associates of Cape Cod, which they work nice. on horseshoe crab blood. Oh. oh, very cool. It's blue, right? Uh, it's so similar to, well, they use it for testing in yeah. many, many different yeah, things. Yeah, tons of stuff. I think that's how they test if a lab is star. I'm s we could have, yeah. We Super go maybe another science. ten meters. Same due north. Mm, well, which is slow so to I think we're centered, we're centered right up on it. So another ten north. Let's say we want more of a zero seven zero. No, am I looking at that wrong? So we're here. We want to come a little. Yeah, I'm at three three five. We just want to go a little bit that way on the image. Um, okay, I thought we wanted to close range on that stern portion because they're still 20 meters away. Okay, let's go zero. Should we just do your heading right now? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, like and 20 meters is, in that direction. Um, 335. Okay. 335. And do we want to do 15? meters? Uh, why don't we go with 10 and that'll keep us, uh, that'll give us good viz on it and then we can start going a little bit off to the uh, east of it. Roger that. Bridge, nav. Please do a ship move, 10 meters, bearing 335. Thank you. 
Mm. Tito, she's in here. She says she loves you too, and that horseshoe crab blood is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. I don't want to digress, but I think it's used to verify that things have been cleaned in sterile surroundings or something. Lots of use. And if you've never seen a horseshoe crab, if you don't live on, I think it's just the Northeast. Uh, look one up. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's amazing you look at the on bottom. The, uh, on the full moons, the beaches oh, yeah. practically get covered. And I used to go to Swansea and work with my sister, and we'd go capture them. That's where my parents them. live. Yeah, yep. we used to sell them to the uh, down the fishing boats to use as bait. Yeah, on a good full moon, you can barely walk out in the water without stepping on one. Yeah, they were just yeah. crazy. They're terrifying as a child <laughs> in water. That's so interesting to hear. I've seen them only in like in aquariums before. Yeah. Supposedly they haven't changed in uh, quite a while. Yeah, they're like they're hundreds uh, of millions of years. Very old species. Randy has some cool horseshoe crab tattoos. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. And a beat. In Connecticut, there's a crowdsourced program for tracking them. So there's tagged horseshoe crabs, and if you find one on the beach, you take a picture of it, send it to the Department of Environmental Management, and they'll send you a silver coin with a horseshoe crab on it. What? And so they, they can track the movement of horseshoe crabs that way. That's a pretty wow. good incentive. Yeah. I want to do that. Um, Where'd you say that was, Jim? Conne Connecticut. Connecticut. In yes. the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and Canada, it was uh, just normal recreational scuba divers who first observed and started reporting uh, what was became known as uh, sea star wasting syndrome uh, that devastated the stock of sea stars, especially the pycnopodias, that were very, very large uh, sea stars, usually with 24 legs. Uh, mm. That has uh, been studied extensively, but a big role of citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our colleagues, we were just up doing work with Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, they have a cadre of citizen scientists who will look at, you know, some of the camera footage they've recorded and they have this portal where those people can log events uh, growing role for others to participate and contribute to this work. Yeah, there's all sorts of apps uh, mm -hmm. coming out for supporting citizen science, and so oh, you can contribute in many ways, even if you're not um, a scientist, per se. Well, if you uh, see something and wonder about it and form a question in your mind, uh, you're, you're a scientist. That's yeah. That's the process, the first steps in the process. Really just kind of stalled, it's weird. It's, uh, the view hasn't changed to yeah. by a more than yeah. a meter or so. It's been know. three moves. So we put in a total of 40 meters, essentially trying to get back towards the stern and yet to really see it translate down the cable. Wow, do you or think not. we have a current? Not sure why that is. No, the Holothorian didn't seem to be affected. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, it, the little bits of marine snow we do see seem to be going straight down. Yeah, I feel like just once you have a certain amount of momentum in one direction. And oh yeah, it's so hard to change. Yeah, we've yeah. been moving the other. Yeah, well, we'll give it time. I mean, we we obviously have to change direction, so it's it, a lot of cable. It, take, it takes the time it takes, yeah. right? Yeah, and I guess it does have probably a, that pendulum effect, whereas if you direct the force the opposite way, it's just going to swing it out even further at first. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping we can 
get near the stern before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Hand it off. Someone else's problem. <laughs> But it is one of the uh, characteristics of a four-hour watch is if you get uh, into a very difficult situation as you think of solutions, somebody invariably looks up at the clock and goes, well, <laughs> we only have 12 minutes left. Invariably looks up at the clock and goes, well, <laughs> we only have 12 minutes left. <laughs> it's crazy what fresh minds will do, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> That is a large depression. I wonder what happens to live munitions when they descend to these pressures. Do you think they just go off at some depth in the water column or? Could that have been... Tito, you think this is something impacting, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed you. You think this is something impacting the seafloor here? I do. It, you know, it's almost the shape of the hole. What's that, Derek? And it just seems like the pressure wave may have... Oh, right, it. right. Yeah, the shape is just too distinct. Anything I've noticed, we've swung just a couple meters to the north here. Yeah. So once we get around this little area, I'm curious, just like, what's the plan for the rest of the dive? Yeah, so we um, we started about amidships on the stern side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've now moved uh, through the aft half of the, I'm sorry, of the port side. We've moved through the aft part of the port side to the stern. Uh, we're now going to come back along the starboard side of the wreck, um, all the way to the bow, which will take a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then... Um, do the bow to amidships where we started, um, and then probably come up and over the wreck to uh, to take a look at. Um, there's like there's like a large piece of debris off the starboard side. We'll either do that next or do a line uh, along the. Uh, it's not the flight deck because that's gone, but but basically just overhead the wreck mm -hmm. um, to take a look at. Uh, you know what we can see from the top down. Do we know the beam of the vessel? Do we know what? The, how wide the vessel was, the beam? Uh, yes, it was. Um, come on, uh, 100, 107 feet, 32 meters. Okay. Yeah, it was wider because it was a battleship um, hull uh -huh. rather than a uh, 
cruiser hull. Looks like we're creeping closer. So I just uh, rotated the heading and I'm using full thrust. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah, give it a little push. Yeah, it's just fighting. When you swing back to right, there's a little rectangle of light thing right at the edge of that. It could just be sediments, like right there. Do you see that? I think it's just sediment. Oh, runaway zoom, sorry. Just to the left there? Uh, oh, looks like the size of a playing card. Yeah. I don't think it's an ace of hearts, but you never know. Oh, runaway zoom again, sorry. Is there something in our lights? Nope. You can see in that when I zoom? Or is it just me over here? Oh, it's a runaway zoom again. Oh, let it go. I'm not sure that's, uh, I can't really tell. Looks a little like a kitchen sponge. Watch change of video. What do you think about putting another move in? So I think what's going to happen is we're going to get to a point where it starts to swing and then we'll overshoot. So it, okay. you know, it's be patient. But on the other hand, you know, throwing another move in if it does start to overshoot, bringing it back a little bit. I mean, it's been... It's been a while. It's been 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I think another move at 325 two, three, or 335? Three, three, yeah. 335, 10 meters. I'd like to do a ship move 10 meters bearing 335. Thank you. We're in the midst of a watch change, everybody, so just bear with us. Uh, we're going to be swapping out some personnel for the next watch.
Good morning, everyone. 8 to 12 watch is taking on, and we're just getting settled here over the next few minutes. Crazy what <laughs> fresh minds will do, you yeah. know. <laughs> that is a large depression. And what happens to live munitions when they descend to these pressures? Do you think they just go off at some depth in the water column? Or? Could that have been? Tito, you think this is something impacting, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed you. You think this is something impacting the seafloor here? I do. It, you know, it's almost the shape of the hole. What's that, Derek? And it just seems like the pressure wave may have. Oh, caused. right, right. Yeah, the shape is just too distinct. Anything I've noticed, we've swung just a couple meters to the north here. Yeah. So once we get around this little area, I'm curious, just like, what's the plan for the rest of the dive? Yeah, so we um, we started about amidships on the stern side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've now moved uh, through the aft half of the, I'm sorry, of the port side. We've moved through the aft part of the port side to the stern. Uh, we're now going to come back along the starboard side of the wreck, um, all the way to the bow, which will take a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then... Um, do the bow to amidships where we started, um, and then probably come up and over the wreck to uh, to take a look at. Um, there's like there's like a large piece of debris off the starboard side. We'll either do that next or do a line uh, along the. Uh, it's not the flight deck because that's gone, but but basically just overhead the wreck mm -hmm. um, to take a look at. Uh, you know what we can see from the top down. Do we know the beam of the vessel? Do we know what? The, how wide the vessel was, the beam? Uh, yes, it was. Um, come on, uh, 100, 107 feet. 
32 meters. Okay. Yeah, it was wider because it was a battleship uh, hull uh -huh. rather than a uh, cruiser hull. <clears throat> yeah, looks like we're creeping closer. So I just uh, rotated the heading, and I'm using full thrust. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, give it a little push. Yeah, it's just fighting. When you swing back to right, there's a little rectangle of light thing right at the edge of that. It could just be sediments, like right there. Do you see that? I think it's just sediment. Oh, runaway zoom, sorry. Just to the left there? Uh, oh, looks like the size of a playing card. Yeah. I don't think it's an ace of hearts, but you never know. Oh, runaway zoom again, sorry. Is there something in our lights? Nope. You can see in that one I zoom? Is it just me over here? Oh, it's a runaway zoom again. Oh, let it go. I'm not sure that's, uh, I can't really tell. Looks a little bit like a kitchen sponge. Watch change in video. What do you think about putting another move in? So I think what's going to happen is we're going to get to a point where it starts to swing and then we'll overshoot. So it, okay. you know, it's just be patient. But on the other hand, you know, throwing another move in if it does start to overshoot, bringing it back a little bit. I mean, it's been... It's been a while. It's been 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think another move at 325 or 335? 335, yeah. 10 meters. Yeah. Bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move 10 meters, bearing 335. Thank you.
in the midst of a watch change, everybody, so just bear with us. Uh, we're going to be swapping out some personnel for the next watch. Good morning everyone, 8 to 12 watch is taking on and we're just getting settled here over the next few minutes.
Okay, everyone. Good morning. Aloha kakayaka, kako. Thank you for tuning in and for your patience as we switch over to the 8 to 12 watch. O Mahinalani Cavalieri Ko'oinoa no O'ahu Mai'au. My name is Mahinalani Cavalieri and I am from the island of O'ahu and it is my great privilege and honor to be here joining with you on board the exploration vessel Nautilus. And we are currently on the Ala Omoana Kai'uli expedition, the path of the deep sea traveler. Um, we are now in, or we have been in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And we are currently diving at about 5,440 meters on the shipwreck of the aircraft carrier IJN Kaga. And this was built in the 1920s. And Kaga means increased joy, named after the former Kaga province in southwest Japan. Um, and unfortunately was sunk during the Battle of Midway. Now I think we're all getting settled in. Um, for some of our viewers, we just want to mahalo you, say thank you, mahalo nui loa. From, we have folks tuning in from the United States, Japan, Belgium, Canada, Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Poland, Germany, Czech Republic, Brazil, Vietnam, Lebanon, Italy, Iceland, Hungary, Greece, France, Finland, Spain, Denmark. So mahalo to all of you viewers around the world who are exploring with us. Uh, we're so privileged to be able to share this with all of you. Um, I think we're just about settled in. So maybe when some of our other crew members in the control van have a moment, we can just slowly go around. and introduce ourselves. Nav, are we making our way back toward the uh, back toward the wreckage? <clears throat> right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> sorry, I was explaining just to uh, just to the pilots. Um, so sorry about that. We made we made our way down the port side and. Um, we're currently swinging basically across the stern to get up to the starboard side. Um, and yeah, we, we're going to try and get that, trying to get us maneuvered as quickly as we can. Roger. Thank you.
This might be a good time during this maneuver to get some uh, introductions going. Uh, Mahina, would you like to start us off, please? Hi, everyone. Aloha mai kako. Mahina Lenny Cavalieri ko uinoa. Uh, no, uh, Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Mahina Lenny Cavalieri, and I'm from the island of Oahu. Thank you for joining us today on this um, Ala Aumona Kaiuli expedition, the path of the deep sea traveler. Um, it's a privilege and honor to be diving on this historical site, uh, the IJN Kaga. So really grateful to be here. Thank you so much. My name is Kukui. I'm one of the data loggers on board, and I am beyond extremely humbled and grateful and blessed to be here with all of you folks here on board and on shore at this very special and sacred site. Mahalo. Virginia? Hello, all. I'm Virginia. I'm a PhD graduate student at Florida State University, and I am I study mostly uh, seamount communities, um, and I'm very honored and, and excited to be here today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and I'm uh, very pleased and privileged to be here doing this very special investigation. And sitting down next to me, just back from breakfast, is Mike. Anyway. Good morning, everyone. Mike Brennan uh, from Search Inc., Maritime Archaeologist. I'm the uh, co, -lead co lead scientist for this expedition. And yeah, very excited to be here on our uh, third aircraft carrier wreck from the Battle of Midway, which is a uh, just amazing. It takes a lot of uh, work and organization and technology and uh, patience to to get to shipwrecks at this depth. And we uh, also acknowledge the people who did expeditions out here uh, before us that located these wrecks. Uh, Ballard in 1998, along with Woods Hole in the Navy, uh, and then the Petrel and, and Vulcan Inc. in 2019, as well as a, a, an expedition by Nauticos that located some of the wreckage from, from this wreck as well in 99. So a lot of time and, uh, and people involved in, in getting this to happen. All right, and uh, this is Val Finlayson. Um, I'm a uh, geologist and science uh, co-lead, the other co-lead on this expedition. Um, I'm here helping run support for the archaeology dives. Um, just wanted to say thank you everyone who's uh, joining us on these. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be part of such a unique expedition. Thank you. And we'll toss it over to uh, Catalina. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Catalina Rubiano. I'm a master's student at the University of South Florida um, in marine science. And I'm serving as a navigator here, uh, trying to coordinate our movements and our way around these really incredible uh, wreck sites. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, Robert Waters, I'm a ROV pilot. Uh, back ashore, I'm OET's facilities manager and ROV engineer. Uh, it's exciting to see all these wrecks here. Uh, we've been looking for something to put in our lobby in the facility in San Pedro, and I think highlighting this would be a big thing. So, uh, uh, Zach, you want to introduce yourself? I was on an SPL. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, Zach Gonzalez, and uh, I'm here as Robert's co-pilot. Been piloting ROVs for a few years, and uh, it's just a real joy to come out here and, and experience all these wrecks and uh, see everything firsthand. Hi, 
I'm Amber Flynn. I'm a video engineer. Um, I'm assisting with the images that you're seeing, um, uh, mostly zoom focus such. Uh, I started back in Nautilus in 2016 as an intern and I'm just thrilled to be back here uh, and seeing all this with you. Thank you. Mahalo everyone and thank you. I mean, you can tell that we have such a diverse group of folks on board. I was just doing a ship to shore interaction with a group of sixth graders in California. Dan and I had mentioned that at any one given day you can hear three to four different languages spoken on board the Nautilus. So I think that is just a great statement in and of itself. Uh, Robert Waters, we actually have a viewer here online that says that they've been watching you since 1985 and they, you're a real inspiration and I don't know about 1985, but... <laughs> <laughs> they said you're a real inspiration. <laughs> um, and uh, you're, you know, they ha they have great admiration for you. Oh, so. thank you. <laughs> <coughs> I did run into a kid in a, in a Costco once. I was wearing a Woods Hole t-shirt, and he ran up to me so excited. <laughs> <coughs> he found out I was a uh, Alvin pilot. Wow! And uh, we actually arranged for him that he was a big fan of Bob Ballard, and mm -hmm. we actually arranged for him to go to a talk Bob was doing in Palm Springs. So he wow. got to meet him, and he, he came down and uh, him and his family, and they got a personal tour of the submarine in San Diego. Yeah. Very cool. Bob. How cool is so that? That's maybe amazing. it's him. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right, so if you're just joining us, we are maneuvering back toward the wreck. Uh, right now you're seeing um, some uh, disturbed sediments on the seafloor, but we should be, uh, we should, uh, be back on the wreck here in uh, uh, the next, I don't know, probably 10 minutes. We have to move slowly because uh, we are operating at uh, about 5.4 kilometers depth. So these moves have to be very slow yeah. and deliberate so that I mean, we, until we uh, get in there and see what uh, we're dealing with, I think. Because uh, they take some time to translate yeah. down the cable. We want to make sure that um, we are not disturbing Doesn't look like uh, got any of the far. site with our movements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've made a little bit of headway. So speaking of interesting jobs, one of our, uh, one of my, my former uh, co-workers at Woods Hole uh, had always wanted to be an astronaut since she was a kid, and she got into the program in 2017. Wow! Oh, wow! Is going to be launching on a Soyuz in three oh, wow. days. Oh wow! Wow! That's fantastic. That's incredible. Awesome. I thought being an astronaut would be really cool when I was very <laughs> young. But instead of going to the skies, I ended up uh, trying to look inside the Earth as a geologist. <laughs> kind of went the opposite direction, but <laughs> both are absolutely fascinating because at some point there is an intersection between those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Most so. definitely. We've had, uh, I think, a couple of astronauts out here on the ship. Wow. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, actually, we, we pulled into Galveston and had an astronaut sit in the nav seat, and uh, yep. she gave us a tour of the Johnson Space Center. Like, we got to go onto the floor of the 
or the uh, control room for the ISS. Mm -hmm. and she was pointing out things on the space station, and the, and the guy operating the camera was panning over and <laughs> letting us get a close look at it. Wow. Exploration is for everyone. It really is. In the skies, in the seas, on board Nautilus. And Nautilus is where so many different disciplines can come together. Mm-hmm, yeah. I, rem I remember thinking when I was a kid, there were three things I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. An astronaut, a diver, or a bike mechanic. Wow. <laughs> I had a shot at being a bicycle mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, bike mechanic is one of my backup plans if it's this whole geology thing doesn't work out. It's not too late. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say at, at times like this that from the control van, you know, we do, um, you know, joke around a little bit sometimes. We put in long hours. Uh, we need to keep our spirits up, but we're conducting a very serious survey. And when we get back to the wreck, you know, uh, we'll, be, we'll be back on doing our best to interpret the site to gain that historical and archaeological information that... Uh, is the way this wreck tells its story mm -hmm. about a very significant event in the past and a very terrible event. And so as we are gathering that information and understanding it from the point of view of historians and archaeologists and uh, preservationists, we're also aware of the tragic loss of life. So um, we do our best to honor that with protocol and with mm -hmm. recognition at moments of first sight of the wreck and a departure and um, you know at times we joke around a little bit and we, we kind of need to given the 24-hour operations the ship runs but we're always aware that this is a significant um, site to survey and we do so with uh, the utmost respect and remembrance for those who were lost. And in this site particularly, the IJN Kaga was uh, a devastating at attack and, and loss of life, young life, sailors and airmen. So that's always in our mind and uh, in our awareness. Mm -hmm. Mahalo, Hans. Yes, and as we know, this is our third archaeological dive, um, you know, that we were privileged with being able to execute as a team. And it does conjure up a lot of emotions for many of us, and we process it and cope with it in different ways. And I know, as some of you viewers are as well um, at home or wherever you're viewing from, um, in these moments, you know, it's really important that we lean on one another, we support one another, we help one another. Kokua aku, kokua mai. Um, to help and to be helped. And to really allow for that space to feel, to grieve, and to embrace it. And then in that way, when we unite in that way, we are also able to heal. Um, we're able to commemorate those lives lost, these souls here to remember them, to uplift their stories, and to pay the respect that they most definitely deserve for their great sacrifice.
So Hans, we have a question from the public chat asking if Kaga had a uh, sister ship. Uh, well, I know Kaga was in the first carrier division with Akagi. So um, they, you know, sailed together and operated together. I don't know if Akagi would be considered a sister ship to Kaga. Kaga was, of course, initially laid down as a, as a battleship due to the restrictions from the, the treaty following World War I and then converted into first a multi-level carrier with multiple flight decks, a very interesting design, mm -hmm. and uh, renovated then uh, to a single flight deck on top and multiple hangars below. The Akagi was a battle cruiser, not a battleship initially, and then constructed the same way with multiple flight decks, and again renovated into a single flight deck atop and, um, and hangars below. So there are differences in the origin and initial designs, certainly. The two ships are somewhat similar in length, the Akaga is a little shorter because of the battleship origin and, you know, and not designed as a battle cruiser, so a little bit slower. Okay. I think 28 knots rather than over, over 30 knots for the Akagi speed. But that's a good question for our historians ashore and our experts there at the command center in Silver Spring, our shoreside experts. Are you, is Phil and others, are you online? They might be away, but we'll save yep. that question for them. Uh, yep. Once, once we uh, once we can uh, reach them. Yep. And we've doing been doing some of the planning for this part of the mission with our Japanese archaeological colleagues as well. So on uh, the Akagi dive, we. We're pleased to have Jun Kimura, Dr. Kimura, give his input and, and um, feedback for the survey. And hopefully today we might be joined by Jun or Akafumi Iwabuchi or Randall Sasaki. We'll see if they have the, the time and ability to tune in. Yeah, we'd, we'd be honored to have them join us. So there has been a previous dive on the Kaga. Um, that one was uh, less extensive than the survey we're performing today, correct? Uh, I believe so. I can't say for sure. I haven't seen the, the data. Okay. I don't think we have access to that, that video data. I see. Or results from that dive. That was by Vulcan Inc. in 2019. And yes, they lowered, they, they discovered the wrecks with Side scan sonar operated from a platform called an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle, and then lowered an ROV to the site to conduct a non-invasive survey. But I mm -hmm. simply don't know how extensive that was. Gotcha. Not having access to that data. So we're facing facing it on like that now. I'm just trying to see. Three four five with that line us up going well, up the side. Sort of all over side. Three four five. You, you wanna come in a little to it? Yeah. Okay. Three two zero maybe. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like twenty meters out now.
Yeah. Bridge now. I was gonna do three zero zero, just kind of like straight in. Okay. Could we please move one zero meters at bearing three zero zero? Yes, thank you. For folks who may be just tuning in, we have we're doing a very slow and deliberate survey. And one of the reasons for that is this is at such a, such a depth that the Hercules ROV cannot come down here. The Hercules ROV, which is part of a two-body survey system, has a rating to 4,000 meters, and we're currently at 5,429 meters depth. So we're using the tow sled Atalanta to survey the wreck uh, and the sled hangs off a single cable of course 3.3 miles of cable that bring us down into the dark depths of the ocean and to move the tow sled around and survey the wreck we rely on the ship moves at the surface so we move very slowly and deliberately to not make contact at all with the wreckage of the IJN Kaga. And when we change course with the ship on the surface, it takes a while for that change and all movements to transmit themselves down the cable to the cameras and to the platform at Atalanta. So we've learned to be very patient in the control van and hope you're patient too with us. You can do it, Internet. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha kakayaka kakoa. This is Daniel Kinzer, a science communication fellow. Just jumped off a, a live ship-to-shore interaction, so late for my watch. Sorry, boss. <laughs> Dr. Val. Um, All well, she, good. <laughs> it's great to... You <clears throat> had an excuse. <laughs> yeah, I had an excuse. Uh, had a pass. Had a hall pass. It was... Uh, it's great to be back in the depths with you all and, and on this um, back back here again uh, in another uh, incredibly sacred and humbling site. I'm looking forward to, uh, to catching up as I listen in to, um, to the stories we have to tell and, and what we see as we continue to explore the IJN Kaga. Please keep sending your comments and questions and stories in on Nautilus Live. We're joined around the world, of course, the United States and Japan and, uh, and the Hawaiian Islands are tuning in, but also Canada and the UK, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, Denmark, Vietnam, Portugal, Lebanon, Italy, Iceland, Indonesia, Hungary, Greece, Finland, Spain, Estonia, the Czech Republic, Brazil, uh, viewers from nearly every time zone. Um, around the world uh, joining us uh, in these far remote reaches of Papahana Mokuakea, Sacred Waters, Aina Kua, Wawakua. Just immediately struck as soon as I'm back on watch just by the profound privilege of, of being in this space. So, mahalo everyone, aloha. So I have an answer from uh, about the uh, sister ship. Um, sister ship of the Kaga is the Tosa. 
Thank you for that. Yep, they are. Um, see, they were intended to be part of the Japanese quote eight four fleet, comprising eight battleships and four battle cruisers, successor to the proposed eight eight fleet. So Tosa and Kaga were intended to be used as high-speed uh, battleships under this plan. Thank you, Russ. One of our shoreside investigators, Russ Matthews, added in the science chat that Tosa was never completed. I guess maybe in a sense you could say that the Kaga was never completed. It was not going to be a battleship in the end. It became an aircraft carrier. Wow, yeah. Well, and it was the same with um, Akagi. Uh, its sister ship, Amagi, and it, that's the, that was the class that it was, um, was actually damaged in, a, in an earthquake uh, beyond repair. Uh, so, th so that was... The Kagi ended up being the only one uh, converted to an aircraft carrier that was supposed to have been the other one, but uh, they went with Kaga after that earthquake because uh, of the damage to it. Nope. Try. Bridge now. Could we please move one zero meters at bearing two eight five? Thank you. Hans and Mike, for, for my own reference and understanding, I know these ships went through a number of conversions from uh, potential battleships to, to then carriers that included three, I believe three flight decks, was that right? And then scaled back when that was deemed kind of uh, non-functional. Uh, what was the time period that those conversions took place over? Yeah, those, um, those conversions, um, I think, took place between 1935 and 38. Um, and they, they made those other flight decks into hangar decks and then, uh, yeah, just used the top uh, flight deck for, for launching and recovering aircraft. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Aircraft just became heavier and bigger, and they couldn't launch effectively from the lower hangars, from the lower flight decks. That's my understanding anyway. I imagine uh, innovation, especially uh, military technologies at this time, were advancing so rapidly it would be would be difficult to 
to design and plan, execute a ship, <laughs> uh, not really knowing where uh, associated technologies were going to be just a few years down the road. It's a bit like now, where we're <laughs> constant updates uh, in technology. Um, I'm just speculating there, but it seems no, like that would have been a difficult task. Oh, you're, you're dead on the money there, you're spot on. I mean, when you look at how quickly uh, naval aviation evolved, you can see that, that exact thing. And this, the same thing with amphibious operations. You know, it used to be that, that warships would put sailors into the, the longboats and the gigs and row them ashore and have them jump onto the beach. But that's an incredibly hazardous operation. So very quickly, in the 20s and 30s, you have the development of a whole range of specialized landing craft and assault vehicles self-propelled vehicles, amphibious um, support vehicles, and uh, to conduct that kind of campaign in the Pacific. And in the Hawaiian Islands, a lot of training happened. Yeah. And so underwater around the main Hawaiian Islands, we see the remnants of landing craft yeah. and Amtraks and other things. Um, unfortunately, we see the ordnance underwater that was lost at the time and other places also disposed so yeah it's a there's a real cost to the to the to innovation uh especially when you're talking yeah. about military yeah it's a consideration it there is a historical aspect to it of course there can be it can be understood archaeologically but it has an impact on the ecosystem an impact on the underwater environment Absolutely. And culturally, it means something as well, because that is often debris of a type in very special areas. I know it keeps a, a number of cultural practitioners in the Hawaiian Islands out of spaces or makes it very difficult for, uh, for them to access those spaces uh, because they have to be so careful or tread lightly around um, what could be very dangerous uh, leftovers from this uh, from this period of history. That's right. If you're tuning in online, um, you're, we are we are um, on the IJN Kaga, uh, over 5,400 meters deep, on camera number three. Uh, if you're either looking at the uh, at the quad um, or want to toggle over that, you can see our position. Uh, relative to the ship on sonar and uh, I think as we're making continue making a, our current move start to see more of that come into come into view Hans and Mike, I um, I know you guys don't get much sleep, but uh, while we're diving these wrecks, but uh, I was able to get some last night and and missed uh, several hours of of diving on the Kaga, and, and just just curious about some general observations about how it compares to the other um, to our experience on a Kagi and and uh, on the Yorktown. Yeah, the big difference is that um, there's a lot less of the upper structure here. So four bombs uh, were dropped on this carry as opposed to the one on Yorktown and one on Akagi. Five? Oh, five. Hans says five. Um, and so that uh, detonated um, both aviation fuel and uh, torpedoes and bombs that were on the hangar deck and blew off, you know, much of the superstructure. Um, one of the bombs actually hit the, uh, the command tower as well. Oh, wow. Um, and so we're seeing a much lower relief uh, shipwreck here. It's also uh, buried about similarly in the in the sediment to where um, uh, was. to where Akagi was buried. Um, but we're just not seeing the upper structure. There's no hangar deck, no flight deck uh, remnants really whatsoever from what we've seen so far. 
Wow. Um, so that, uh, that's really the big difference here. Yeah, a significant difference from the experience as a viewer um, as we're, you know, rather than making those rounds around the flight deck and seeing a lot of those gun tubs and seeing some of those superstructures, we're, we're not seeing that on the Kaga because of the battle damage it took. Um, yeah. Interesting. So it looks like we're just getting the wreck in view again uh, to the uh, upper left of the, of the video screen. And we'll um, we'll start this long um, survey of the uh, st uh, stern to bow of the uh, the starboard side of the wreck. Those images from uh, from a few years ago, the sort of brief uh, visual that they that they were able to get, I think in tw 2019. Um, what did what did that capture? What did that tell us about the wreck? Those from back then. Uh, I haven't seen uh, all of that footage. Um, I think it uh, it documented some of the um, the upper parts of it. I'm not sure uh, how, in terms of how much uh, coverage I got. Have you seen any of it? We don't have access to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If you're curious about what we're seeing on channel three here, that is a uh, that screen is showing Atalanta's sonar. We're using that to keep track of um, features. Uh, in this case, you're seeing uh, reflections uh, of uh, the shipwreck itself and some other debris that is uh, sitting uh, to the right on the right side of the screen relative to uh, Atalanta, which is in the center those circles. So we're just making sure we were maneuvering, maneuvering very carefully and uh, uh, using this to track how far away we are from uh, any debris so that we do not um, impact it in any way. This is a uh, non-invasive video only survey that we're conducting. So that's an essential navigation tool we're using. Val, is it right that uh, each ring there represents 10 meters? Is that the scale of on that sonar? I believe so. Catalina? Um, yeah. 10 um, meters? Actually, these are 20 meter divisions that we have us set it out right now. 20 ah, meters. 20 thing. meter, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Nav, do we need to move a little bit to the left to get the record? Yeah, view? that's what we've been trying to do. It's, it's extremely laggy and yeah. it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> Catalina's gonna go down again and just uh, yank the um, yank the cable over yeah. for us. Yeah, so yeah. these dives require a lot of uh, patience on everybody's end, and uh, everybody up here in the control van is doing a marvelous job with that. You know, because if we move any faster, that um, can endanger the cable and the tow sled, as well as the wreck and we want to keep everything intact. Yeah, and, and Robert mm -hmm. observed, I think he might be right, It's we're making these moves that are trying to bring us to the ship, but somehow we're ending a little bit further off, so it's maybe there's a current down there pulling us, but let's, we'll see if we can we can ride it. Right, or pulling pulling anywhere on that cable within 3.3 miles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, frankly, I'm I'm still amazed that we can do these types of surveys with this situation of the tow sled on that cable with the yeah. pilots bringing that tow sled within five meters of these wrecks that we're seeing and non-invasively it's i just wasn't sure that something like that could be done and i've never seen that done before it speaks to the sheer talent we have with our uh, in our pilot navigational teams Especially on the 8 to 12 watch. <laughs> I thought the 0 to 4 a.m. watch was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you would. You would. <laughs> <laughs> just a just little plug in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love all our watches, this entire crew, That's doing true. an outstanding job on what has been an incredibly intense. I know we keep getting questions about uh, Soryu and Hiryu. People want to know where are we going next. and. 
I don't know if everyone at home realizes uh, the intensity, the, the challenge, um, the effort that goes into uh, to conducting these, these missions all the time, but uh, I can tell you it's, um, it's uh, quite the journey and uh, requires an incredible collaborative and team effort and with, with so much talent on board. So we appreciate everyone tuning in. We appreciate your patience and uh, we appreciate you just taking in these historic historic moments with us as we honor and survey uh, these shipwrecks. Yeah, and that said, um, we would also be nothing without uh, the talents of our video team mm -hmm. yeah. who uh, are working Amber. with the pilot, uh, the pilots and the navigator in order to uh, bring in some of these just mind blowing shots that we're, uh, that we're uh, able to look at in order to uh, conduct these surveys. Thank you very much. And of course, to you as well, guiding us through uh, what we're seeing and educating uh, like the biology, the geology, uh, along with the archeology. span So thank you all. I mean, I'm almost thinking maybe just a big jump that way. Eh, I don't know. Yeah. Do you think we're, I, I think we're probably still swinging. Uh, no? you mean, for, you mean inward from the last move? Yeah. Or? I mean, from the last couple of moves, no? Well, the last couple of moves have been trying to get us in, but we're we're still we're actually getting a little bit further from the ship. We had been right. like less than twenty meters, and now we're like twenty five okay. meters. Can we can we move just directly towards the wreck? Yeah, no, I mean that's what that's what we have been doing. So I'll I'll just keep trying that. Okay. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> Bridge now. Can we move um, two zero meters at bearing two seven five? Thank you. Seems as though Kanaloa is is tugging at our lines. <laughs> and, uh, we yeah. should uh, we should probably continue to attend to that, and it's. Uh, it's tricky work. The last two, uh, the last two dives, those watching on the internet might have thought, "Oh, this must be so easy." Mm -hmm. The ROV is just landing uh, right on top of the craft, and and um, and then our pilots and navigators so skillfully, and video engineers so skillfully, bringing us around the wreck with such great views. Mm -hmm. uh, but this work is incredibly delicate and challenging. There are a lot of factors. So much we can't, almost everything we cannot see. What's going on down there? Only a small. Uh, beam of light, so uh, always moving slowly and carefully. Yeah, and we have uh, not a lot of information on what uh, mid-level and deep ocean currents are like, so um, you know, uh, we, we have to adjust for that on the fly. If you're uh, just settling into the office and um, 
finding us as a distraction from your work. We appreciate you. <laughs> and uh, we are here on the seafloor, over 5,400 meters depth, um, just off, you can see in our sonars, uh, IJN Kaga, a Japanese aircraft carrier, battleship turned aircraft carrier, uh, sunk in the Battle of Midway. This is uh, our fifth dive of the Ala Amwana Kaiuli expedition in the sacred waters of Popohanaumokuakea, America's largest marine national monument, one of the world's largest marine protected areas. Protecting, of course, not just these incredible archeological historical sites, but also just uh, incredible biodiversity from surface to seafloor. Uh, and we look forward to completing these these wreck dives and all that we will have learned, uh, the humility that we will have learned um, and entered this space with and carry that over to uh, explore the geology and, and, and biology of several nearby seamounts, uh, ancient seamounts. So yeah. stay tuned in with us throughout, throughout the month of September, the next couple of weeks as the expedition continues. Yeah. And the protection and management, you know, Dan, is also a collaborative effort between many different entities and agencies. Uh, the monument itself, Papahanaumokuakea, is coach, the co-trustees um, are the State of Hawaii, the U.S. Department of Interior, the U.S. Department of Commerce, and Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And then there's a senior executive board, which is the State of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources, the DOI, U.S. Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Services, NOAA, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and then there's also um, a Monument Management Board, which is the Division of Aquatic mm -hmm. Resources, uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife, uh, the U.S. Fish Wildlife Service, um, National Wildlife Refuge System, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Ecological Services, uh, NOAA, Office of um, Marine Sanctuaries and NOAA Marine Fishery Services, and lastly, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So, you know, you can just see by all of the um, groups mentioned previously that this is a huge collaborative effort to protect, to manage the sacred space of Kanaloa, and then even executing this project, this expedition dives, um, the Ala Omoana Kaiuli. There's many partners ashore around the world who have helped to make this a reality. So we're very appreciative for all of the people, uh, this kako, this effort, um, this laulima effort with many hands working together across nations, communities, to bring you all of these images. And, you know, as we mentioned, our pilots, our skillful pilots, navigators, video engineers. We're moving with great caution, with great precision um, to just ensure the safety of all of our crew and all of the equipment. Absolutely, Mahina, mahalo. And incredible institutional, inter-institutional collaboration uh, in protecting this monument. And it's also so valuable, such a revered place amongst the Hawaiian community. I just want to thank our families, uh, our ohana, back home, our communities back home, taking care of Lahaina Maui, taking mm -hmm. care of life mm -hmm. back uh, in, in Ao, while mm -hmm. we can uh, venture out here in Po and, and have this uh, sacred journey. It takes, uh, takes a whole community and team uh, back home in Hawaii and globally around the world. I know it's been fun getting to know about family members of, mm -hmm. our, of our crewmates, of our shipmates who are becoming dear friends. And, I hope I'll get to visit many of them and, and yeah. their homes, various homes around the world. And mm -hmm. of course, they're always welcome and at home in Hawaii. So it's uh, incredible the, the amount of uh, human effort it takes to uh, to endeavor into these remote places. I know mm -hmm. our ex one of our co-expedition leads, Daniel Wagner, talks about you know really the closest people to us when we're this this far out in Papahanaumokuakea are, are those on the International Space Station, yeah. which at this moment might not be entirely true. We have an awesome <laughs> NOAA marine debris team that's up oh. at Kure Atoll, oh, uh, removing uh, the, at the, also at the end of the monument. Um, so those are friends and neighbors mm. just, uh, yeah. just 100 miles away or so. But uh, yeah, really um, takes, takes a massive effort to, uh, to take care of this place and 
or so far out in the middle of the ocean, people might be tempted to, to not have to think about it, but to mm -hmm. the Hawaiian community, to, to us in Hawaii, to those people whose institutions have committed themselves to protecting it, mm -hmm. um, to those folks and families who are connected to this uh, tragic and historic moment at Midway. Um, this is an incredibly important place to our ecosystem, to the health mm -hmm. of, of planet ocean. This is an incredibly, incredibly important place. And Hans had mentioned earlier in our dive that um, when we come into these spaces, then there is often a, and always um, a protocol that is involved. We do have to ask permission. I mean, as Daniel had mentioned, that this place is extremely important, culturally significant, spiritually significant to the native Hawaiian people, to the Kanakoivi. And so coming into this area, we pass the boundary lines of the Tropic of Cancer otherwise known as uh, to the native Hawaiian people. And as we pass this realm, we saw this as going into the world beyond, which is pole, is a place of darkness. It is also a place of great depths. And we as Kanaka, we see this place of the ocean depths or the kai'uli, the sea depths, as an archive, as a library, as a place where we go to be enlightened with this great ancestral information. And so when we journey here and we're exposed to all these different lessons, challenges, um, and through that we grow. We grow as a collective, we grow as individuals, and I think that's what, you know, ocean uh, exploration, voyaging is really about. Uh, various principles that we live by on board, uh, whether it's a va'akaulua, a traditional Hawaiian sailing canoe, such as hokulea or hikianalia, or if it's an exploration vessel, um, such as the Nautilus, so we come on board, we leave our families, um, you know, at the ports, uh, we step away from life ashore and we take on a different kuleana at sea. We take on a different uh, responsibility and we have to rise up to that responsibility because we have many people relying on us, our role, um, and working together to execute, you know, a task, a task that is much larger than ourselves. So just being able to contribute to that, um, just being able to rise up and serve and, you know, handle your, your kuleana, your responsibility with grace, with stillness. I think that's what um, the beautiful part about being at sea, that's what really, you know, keeps me coming back. Oh, mahalo mahina. It looks like we're um, starting to make a little headway, inching closer now, within 20 meters. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. We're patient. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I love, um, I love what you, Mahina, and, and really our whole team bring to the depths of the ocean with us. You know, it's uh, this. This is not designed to just be. Uh, purely an extractive endeavor. Our relationship in Hawaii with our natural environment is a reciprocal one. It's a foundation of aloha. And uh, we enter this place with respect and humility and, and, and the gifts of uh, that we bring with our with our leo, with our voice, mm -hmm. with who we are, um, with, with our own learning. So we we know that learning is a is a mutual relationship. It's something happens that when two people connect mm -hmm. or two spaces or two beings connect and so uh, or many, many yeah. beings. Yeah, it's just amazing to think, uh, can almost imagine all of us um, in the depths at times uh, in this kind of uh, dream-like state that, that we fall into uh, out here, exploring the deep sea and Papahanaumokuakea. And I love all the gifts that we bring. It's a really remarkable group. It really is remarkable. You know, this is my second time on Nautilus, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be back here because of the kind of atmosphere that the ship uh, uh, kind of naturally cultivates. I, I. We were having some great conversations yesterday. I mean, on our ascent coming up, and then even when I was talking to a few of our crewmates um, after one of our meals, and you know, we're the conversations that we have, and what I define as a conversation is. Um, two parties kind of finding this middle ground and, and it's 
an exchange of information and it's exchange of you know emotions feelings and embracing what one another has to say with empathy with understanding um and i think that's one Wait, thing can, that can you mute yourself sorry guys <laughs> sorry you'll go ahead you'll go ahead <laughs> And, you know, as Dr. Val had mentioned that it's this um, ship, the exploration vessel Nautilus, like that atmosphere is cultivated here, uh, this safe place to have these great conversations with people from all around the world, from people with all different backgrounds. Yeah, it's something that I hope, you know, we we're, we're able to bring this deep sea to life for so many people around the world. But um, in the telling of this story, I hope what one of the things we can convey is that this uh, this kind of community, this kind of collaboration, uh, these kinds of relationships and conversations can drive our work around the world, across the planet, whether you're at home, at work, in your classrooms, at school. Um, this uh, One of the things I hope for the world is not just a deep love for the deep sea, but also for one another and for the, all the spaces that we occupy in our daily lives. and thankful for the lessons I'm learning about that here on board. Are we getting to pick up the wreck again? I think yeah, so. The left I'm side there, concerned Robert. concerned because I'm, I'm having trouble holding heading. Yeah, yeah. And we're not moving much, which really concerns me. Yeah, when we swing like that, it throws the sonar image off, but we are picking up the wreck again, and there is material projecting laterally away from the wreck side, it looks like. Sorry, and I just... I'm very concerned that the Understood. reason I'm no, not that's okay. heading. Yep. Protect the people and the equipment. Yeah. Is there is it a current or is it no. something else? No, I'm okay. concerned that we might be hung on something. Might be snagged. And okay. I don't see anything. I've spun around and I don't see anything. But, you know, if there's a line up in the water column that gets across the cable, you don't see it. Right. You know? But the fact that we're having difficulty moving and my, I'm having big trouble holding heading really concerns me here. Okay. We'll, we'll Robert, the next step be. Would you like me to go uh, go get Megan or Daniel, Robert? Uh, yeah, I see. It looks like Megan's in the studio. Or yeah. Yeah. Let me come up a bit and see. Yeah, this. <clears throat> yeah. Not good. We're gonna uh, we're gonna let our ROV pilots and navigators and expedition leads sort sort this out while we um, quietly observe, patiently Stand observe. Stand by. So we settled like hard on that heading. Yeah. It's 
smells a lot like we're hung on something. I'm going to try and spin around here. So as I was going over here, I was like unable to hold heading. It started wild gyrating. Yeah, and then I just let it off, and it, it came around and it was ho holding hard over here. It, it, we, when we have the down camera there, that's when we have a butt camera and we have a down camera. So we don't have or a utility camera and a, and a butt camera. That's all we have. We don't have a lot of cameras. Yeah. If you're watching at home, please please continue stand to stand by. We're just uh, trying to reposition the ROV, make sure that uh, all of the technology is safe, um, that the cable is safe, and uh, we'll hopefully uh, have it resolved and, and be able to get back on the on the Kaga and bring more of that story to you and to the world shortly. Stand by.
I don't know if you guys got, um, if you guys heard they are bringing, they're going to go get Dan to get in a second ROV brain on the job. Copy that, thank you. For all of our viewers online, thank you for standing by.